thanks a lot for having me. Um, so, right, so just a little bit of uh, further background. So, of course, you know, we have the uh, Fit for 55 targets, we have the net zero targets, but I think what's most important to consider for these uh, questions around competitiveness impacts of uh, climate change policies um, is, is really divergence in climate policy stringency across countries, okay? Uh, because that's really uh, the key concern for questions like carbon leakage um, and, uh, and, and competitiveness. And if you look at the data that's produced by my colleagues from the Center of Tax Policy at the OECD, they uh, compute these effective carbon rates. Um, and, and you can see a huge um, you know, divergence across countries between Switzerland, which is on the, the, um, the right-hand side of the graph at above 130 euro per ton of carbon um, price, and Indonesia on the left, uh, which you know, between the uh, fossil fuel subsidies that they give has uh, on average a negative price on, on, on CO2. And, and with the Paris Agreement, of course, well, you know, we can expect those differences to uh, further increase. Um, and so that's, that's of course, uh, a cause for concern. And, um, you know, I'm at the OECD, and I can confirm that uh, this is uh, an obsession among uh, policymakers. Now, um, it's an obsession among policymakers, but also among academics. And uh, that's why there's been a, a lot of literature on, on that, that Mirabel uh, already talked about. Um, in, in the previous uh, presentation, and 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 there, of course, um, if you look then if you look at the data, at, at historical data, uh, you, you you know you don't find much in terms of impacts on on carbon leakage, in terms of impact on uh, you know firm performance, uh, productivity, um, even trade things like that. I mean. Basically, what we find um, is, is, is there's winners and losers, uh, as is to be expected. Um, the, the high productivity firms win, the low productivity firms uh, lose out, and so on. But on average, we, we find um, little, little effects. Now, um, I've been doing a lot of work recently on the European CBAM, on the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. So I reviewed uh, all of this literature again very closely. And I think what's fair to say is um, on the investment, and in particular on the foreign investment channel, there seems to be, uh, well, there's a very small literature, but the literature that's out there seems to be, you know, going into fairly uh, the same direction, which is that it tends to find, um, you know, some effects on, on FDIs from differences in climate policy across countries. So there's these papers from, from Italy, from uh, Germany, uh, you know, seeing evidence that companies regulated by the UETS uh, tended to, you know, open up more subsidiaries abroad in, in non-EU countries um, or, you know, increase production uh, again in the subsidiaries that they already um, own um, abroad. So, on this investment leakage story, I, I think that, you know, it, it's, there are some, you know, causes for, for concern and, and so this is, you know, why it's important to um, to, to look into this uh, very uh, closely. Now, of course, the, um, the limitation of all this literature, uh, which, which Nabil already uh, mentioned, is that, of course, we're looking at past data. Uh, and so, as Mirabel already showed, uh, with the you know, EU ETS carbon price, we've lived in a world where carbon prices, until fairly recently, until, you know, say 2020, uh, was actually very uh, low, very weak, okay? And so that's the data that we've been exploiting. Not only, because we've also used data on energy prices, and there's a lot of differences in energy prices across countries, but, you know, all the, the literature on the ETS has been exploiting this data where the carbon price was between zero and, say, 30 euro a ton of CO2 max. Uh, and, and, of course, it's impossible to use those results and just uh, translate them into uh, potential effects if the carbon price becomes 100 and, and, and you know, in China it stays at, at 10, okay? Um, so, so this is a valid uh, point uh, that I think motivates uh, the, the paper by, by Nabil and, and his colleagues. Um, what I particularly like uh, with this kind of survey is that they can get at a viable that we've been um, so much looking for in all of our studies, which is expected future carbon prices. Because, 
you know, that's really the, the viable uh, that should be driving a lot of the uh, effect that we're looking for, okay? I've been uh, writing papers on uh, innovation activity by companies in the UETS or companies, you know, facing higher energy prices, but of course, R&D activity is not uh, determined by the spot price on the market, it's determined by your expectations of future carbon prices over the next 10 or 20 years, right? And of expectation over this price relative to prices in the rest of the world. Uh, or relative to the price of, say, electricity if you're consuming fossil fuel, okay? So I th that's something that I really like with the paper is that they can elicit future expected carbon prices from the data, which is, you know, typically uh, unobserved. I mean, you can get data on the, you know, futures uh, market, but, but of course then you don't have any heterogeneity across companies, so you don't have any variation to exploit and, and you can't, you know, do any uh, statistical analysis, okay? So, and the other thing that the paper can do is, is to assess how, you know, firms' perceptions and, 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 and reactions correlate with firm characteristics, and I think that's really interesting in terms of the, the uh, design of, of policies, in, in terms of, you know, how to target uh, policies and in particular flanking policies like you know investment support and things like this um, and in terms of political economy okay understanding uh, the, the political acceptability of these uh, of policies is key uh, and I think this is where the the paper can be useful and and that's not exactly the direction in which you take the the paper and the data and so I think those are you know, things that you could um, you know expand on because to me, these are the, the areas where the paper would be most, uh, most useful. Uh, and in that sense, it's, it's complementary to uh, you know, both the exposed analysis, looking at past data, but also the CGE models, they're useful to look into the future, but they're very aggregated you know, with the very large, broad sectors and so on, whereas you have micro data, which is uh, really nice in terms of the variation. Okay, so now let's uh, move into the uh, critiques. Um, so, what's up? Um, so, first on, on the sample, um, so you have, of course, and, and you acknowledge it, huh, Nabil, so it's not, it's something that's in the paper, I'm not, uh, you know, telling you anything new, but you have, of course, a big self-selection problem because, you know, firms decide to respond on, or not, um, and, and you have a large dropout from, from the, the beginning, uh, like two-thirds of the firms, you know, drop out after a few questions, uh, the dropout is much lower for ETS companies. So there are, of course, some questions about the, the composition of your sample, what's left. You know, are you left with the, really, the companies that are really against any form of climate policy? So I think you can do a bit more in terms of, you know, checking those differences between your final sample and the ones that start the, the survey but don't, you know, finish out to all these guys who drop out. Um, you know, and, and also in terms of the representativeness of the sample compared to the, all the ETS companies, for example, in Belgium, or all the, you know, the Belgian firm uh, population. Um, you know, for example, you've got like uh, 20 or a bit of more than 20% of your ETS companies that operate in transport, construction, agriculture, you know, how representative is it um, of, um, of the ETS, for example. So that's on the sample. Now, on the, on the validity of the data, you know, the, the responses that you get, um, again, this is um, a limitation that you, that you perfectly acknowledge in the data, but it's all self-reported by companies, okay? And so, of course, we need to take these with a pinch of uh, salt. Um, and, and, and if you look at the, some of the responses, you know, it's, there are some, some weird things going on. Uh, first, and this was very interesting to learn for me, two-thirds of the companies that responded have no idea what the carbon price is in Europe. No idea, okay? So two-thirds of the companies, of the respondents, uh, say that the carbon price is either below 25 euro or above 125, okay? So there's only one-third that's able to uh, give a, a range, like plus or minus 50 euro, around the, the true carbon price, okay? So they have no idea what, uh, about climate policy, uh, basically. Uh, and yet they claim it's having a lot of impact on their activity, so of course you have to be a bit, uh, you know, uh, cautious there, okay? Um, you have, you know, two-thirds of services companies that claim that they're getting hit by, by climate policy, but of course, um, you know, I struggle a bit to understand how, you know, where do these impacts come from? Uh, you know, what are the inputs that they use? Um, you know, those, those, sorts of, um, those sorts of things. 
Um, and, and, and I think you could also do more, you know, internal consistency checks like this, you know, the reported carbon price that they say. Uh, does this correlate with the impact that they are, uh, to at least check that they're not, you know, randomly uh, uh, replying. Um, okay. And the second thing which I, I really um, would have loved to see, but of course, you know, it's, it's, it's hard work, I, I can imagine. Um, is, is cr cross-checking the validity, but also uh, that would enable many, many uh, additional analyses uh, by, by matching this data with, with the rest of the microdata that you guys might have at, at yeah, NBB, you know. Uh, I mean, for example, with the data that uh, Mirabel just presented before, no, they, they claim they have uh, an input, you know, cost increase. So you can match, uh, you know, you can ask Mirabel and Thomas for the, the, the data and see if actually uh, you observe uh, an impact on, on, on their input costs. You know, is it, uh, is the, what they report, uh, you know, um, sort of backed by, by actual data? Um, you know, they claim they decreased investment. Do you see this in the balance sheet data that you must have uh, at the bank? Um, well, the energy intensity part, um, you know, half of manufacturing firm claims they are energy intensive, for example, in, so that's a self-selection perhaps, but um, that's a selection problem perhaps, but also to give you an idea, so I've been doing a lot of work on the CBAM, as I said, so the, the CBAM products, so 300 goods, uh, those goods in the EU, they represent 1% uh, of uh, EU's value added, uh, half of a percent of EU employment. So the really energy uh, intensive companies, they're not half of manufacturing. Um, so, you know, if you could match this with some energy consumption, I understand the, the, there's not so, you know, such great micro data on energy consumption in, in Belgium, but that would sort of, you know, enable to corroborate the, the validity of your, um, of your data. Uh, on the design of the scenarios, so, um, I, you know, what I, I, I don't know if you will run another survey, okay? Um, but if you do, then, you know, as I said in the beginning, the key to me seems to be the difference between the price in the EU or what happened in the EU and what happened in the rest of the world. Uh, and also uh, about the rest of the policy package, right? So the CBAM is one example, but, you know, uh, there's other uh, policies that are, that are in place. Um, and so these are things that, you know, perhaps you could try to, to, to add uh, because, of course, if you, you know, now they probably assume that nothing changes uh, outside, but the story would be very different if, other, of course, you know, other uh, countries would, would implement uh, stronger carbon prices and, and so looking at what then they would uh, expect uh, the effect to be would be, I think, uh, interesting. And, and finally, and sorry for this uh, very wordy, uh, wordy slide. Um, in terms of the, the policy implications of, uh, of the paper. So I think, you know, in general, the, the main finding of the paper is not so surprising. The firms complain, you know. I mean, we, uh, we've been working on the ETS for, for 20 years since day one they complain, okay. They say it will kill them and then we do all this work uh, on, on, on data and we, we don't see uh, any of this happening. Um, and you know, they, they say this, and in your survey, they say this despite, despite not knowing much about what climate policy is about, uh, or at least in terms of carbon pricing. And, and then, of course, when you tell them the price is going to be 250 euros in 2030, they say, my costs will increase, which, you know, makes uh, perfect sense. And so then you conclude that the challenge is to uh, find the right balance, okay? So you, you present this as a trade-off between the speed of the transition and the effect on the economy. A very old debate uh, in environmental economics. And I think, you know, of course, uh, it's important to, to, to um, strike the right balance, but the speed of the transition is not the only parameter. Um, you have a lot of data, which I find very interesting, on uh, policy uncertainty. You haven't asked for ranges, but you have a question where you ask, you know, how certain are you about the carbon price in the future? They say, absolutely not certain, basically. I mean, I think the, the median response is one over you know, out of 10 or something like this. So the, I think, you know, these questions about policy certainty are, are super important. So adding to the uncertainty, uh, I find a bit um, dangerous. Uh, and I think to me, the key policy is not really, okay, at what speed, but uh, what to do, uh, how to help companies make these, these transitions. And you have all of these questions on the barriers, which, 
you, you present very uh, fast and, and also in the paper, and I think this, is, this has a lot of potential. Uh, you know, in terms of um, going beyond this kind of trade-off conclusion, in terms of, okay, what can we do to help those companies? Because they claim, you know, they, they respond on, you know, investment bar barriers, cost, and, you know, the question I think is also uh, how, to, how to do that uh, well, how to help, you know, companies transition. Um, I'm, I'm done, don't worry. Um, and what have, we done, what have we done so far, okay? And I, so we, we've been collecting data recently on uh, industrial policy expenditures across OECD countries. We're expanding the coverage at the moment. If you look at energy intensive sectors, what governments have been doing is basically subsidize energy costs, okay? That's it. You look at uh, the proportion, so they receive a few grants, you know, for R&D or things like this. But by and large, they, they just, we, we write checks so that they get exempted from their energy uh, prices. If you look at free allowances in the UETS, this is the data uh, from the environment, you know, the European Environment Agency on, on free allowances and emissions for the industry sector, okay? The red bar is the free allowances. So up until 2017, the industry sector in the EU has received more free allowances than they have emitted, okay? So, uh, and, and as a consequence, you know, they have, well, very recently they've started to reduce a bit their emissions by 17%. If you look at 2021, before the energy price crisis, it was, you know, minus 4% in, uh, you know, six, 17 years. Uh, and that's the data for the non-industry sector, half, okay, minus 50%. So, we've been basically the only... Uh, policy instrument we've used is, is just shielding them from uh, paying those prices. Um, think of it, the free allowances, it's 40 billion euro per year, okay, 40 billion, the check that we write. The EU um, innovation fund, which also goes to the industry to fund demonstration projects, you know, to help them uh, transition, it's 1 billion per year, okay. So 1 billion for demonstration R&D project, uh, transitioning, 40 billion free allowances. So that's what we've been doing, plus the energy price exemptions. And I think the balance is, is not right. And uh, I think, you know, your paper can also help, uh, you know, design those policies uh, better so that uh, they can, they can um, transition. Okay, uh, uh, I'm done. And uh, thanks a lot very much for, for having me.